Jesus, this glory divine. Replacing law with love. And grace overflowing. Bringing worth to the weary and redemption for us all. Once again, good morning. Welcome here to uh, Central Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us for the first time, maybe engaging with us, uh, live streaming television, my name is Archie Mason. I'm a senior pastor. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 3. We completed out uh, last week with Romans in chapter 16, and so we spent a few months working through that as a church uh, starting a day. We're in a Christmas series, and today we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3. We're in a series which is called The Thrill of hope, and I am so glad uh, that you guys are here with us today. Let me just reiterate one thing Jonathan said earlier. We do have a Christmas Eve services one, three, uh, and five. We will have overflow out in the Family Life Center. Uh, they are packed out services, so I encourage you to come, bring family, friends. Uh, don't worry about how many cars on the parking lot. We will fit you in the building. It will be a, uh, a good time. And then that Sunday uh, morning, and we have one service, and it's a family service. That means everybody is together uh, at 1030. That's kids, babies, everybody. The Family Life Center will be open, too. And so we'll be taking all three congregations, kind of pile them into one on Christmas morning. Do not want to miss. I'm excited about Christmas. I, I like, Corey's done a great job leading us, a worship team, uh, this morning. Uh, I grew up kind of a traditionalist, I guess you'd say, in regard to Christmas. Now, I know that some of you may not have the memories that, that I have. I've got a lot of great memories just growing up in that small town. Uh, Bisco, both my grandparents lived there, and so we would always get together for Christmas. My uncle, Bill, Uncle Bill worked every Christmas Eve night till really late in the morning. So this is the type of job that he always had. And Uncle Bill would roll in on Christmas morning, and I would always, as a kid, I would look forward to him. He's about 10 or 12 years younger. Well, excuse me, no, he's way younger than my dad. He's more now, I think. So he's younger than my dad. He kind of uh, occurred late in my Grandma Goldie and Papa Harry's marriage, you can say, or whatever. And so, uh, but he would roll in, and he might have a sack. I can remember a few times he had a gift that was wrapped, but a lot of times he just came with me. He's like, hey, I'm here, you know, and so my sister was like, hey, Uncle Bill, and uh, he'd come in like, I didn't have time to wrap it, you know, I had to work late last night, and he would sit down, and he had the coolest gifts. One of the coolest gifts that I got, I don't know how old it was, five, six, a chemistry set. Come on. Probably against the law now, he can't do it. That thing was as uh, big as a medicine cabinet. It had a handle on it. It was metal. You'd carry it around. I opened that thing up. I was old enough to read the directions. I did experiments. I caught stuff on fire. I blew stuff up. It was a great Christmas gift. So some of the kids are out there, yeah, no, you can't have that. It won't work that way. But all of those times, just a lot of great memories, a lot of fun stuff throughout my life. So I would be like many of you. The preacher would get up on Sunday morning and talk about a Christmas cantata or that. I, we'd show up at church. They might have, have a manger, have some straw, baby Jesus, or sometimes somebody be a real baby, you know, in there, and Mary and Joseph. I never really grasped the understanding of why Christmas. You say, well, that's Archie should have known that. Well, I didn't get saved. I was 25, but I grew up in a great home, was in church all the time. I knew he came. I knew that he died, I knew that he was raised again, but I never really grasped the why. Have you ever thought about that, why Christmas? You said, well, yeah, Archie, Christ came, incarnation, born of Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, you know, they put him in a kind of a cave where she was, gave birth to him at. They placed him in a feeding trough, and he lived 30 years in obscurity, basically, he began a ministry about the age of 30. About the age of 33, they crucified him on the cross, and three days later, he rose from the grave. Praise God, hallelujah. But why? <laughs> you say, well, because we're sinners in need of a Savior. Correct answer. But there's a little bit more than that. We live in a broken world. This song that we were just singing, do you believe the world is broken? We do. You know how it goes? Well, look around. It's a broken world. Violence. It's pain. Y'all laughing at my singing. I saw Josh laughing at me in my singing. The, the violence, pain, uh, hurt. It's death, it's loss. Now, as a believer in Christ, as a believer in Christ, we know this world is not our home, amen? 
There's a brokenness out there. You ever wonder, where did all this brokenness come from? I was speaking with a guy this week, and he kind of repeated what sometimes I repeat. And I remember being lost. Lost people do what lost people do because we're lost. We're just broken. Well, today in Genesis chapter 3, it is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. I laugh when I say that because all of God's Word is inspired. Amen. It's God's Word for us. God breathed. We see that in Scripture. It's one of the greatest chapters because we have a front row seat to seeing how the enemy comes and brings about doubt and unbelief. And we see the fall of Adam and Eve. And then we see in Genesis chapter 3 what's called as the Proto-evangelum, which is the first preaching of the gospel. And then we have also in the passage, and it's a lengthy, I'm going to ask you to stand in just a moment if you can, we'll go through it. But we see in the last part where he, the Bible says he made skins and clothed them. And we see the first blood sacrifice occurring way back there in Genesis chapter 3. Why did Christ come at Christmas? Because we live in a broken world. You know, it kind of helps you now when you read John 10, 10, he says, a thief comes to steal and destroy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You see, this is what we call in our series kind of the thrill of hope. So we work through this in this Christmas time. Now, I know you just got seated. I know we've been standing a lot this morning. If you're physically able, I'm going to read through this passage. If you can stand, go ahead. If you want to stay seated, that's fine too. Here we go. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, Has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and gave also to her husband with her. Get this, ladies. He was there with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were open. They knew they were naked, and so they sewed fid leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of a day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And this is funny. So the Lord said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle, And more than every beast of the field, on your belly you will go, the dust you will eat all the days of your life. I will put into me between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You shall, he shall bruise you uh, on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth and pain you'll bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, you've eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it, curses is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because it was uh, from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to the dust you shall return. Now the man called his wife Eve, because she was a mother of all the living. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and clothe them. I'm just going to go ahead and read the rest of it. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. That's a trinity. That's the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit right there. Knowing good and evil, now he might stretch out his hand, take also from the tree of life and to eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground which, from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard uh, the way to the tree of life. You ever wonder why this world is broken? That's where it started, right there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to come together today. Holy Spirit, give us illumination of the text. uh, Give us understanding. Uh, Lord, draw us close to you. Uh, Lord Jesus, save somebody today, I pray. Bring about conviction. Bring about repentance and faith. Save somebody today. It's in your name we pray. The name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you for standing uh, for the uh, public reading of the Word of God. Now, we jump right in here to Genesis chapter 3. So if you go back, if you have time, if you haven't read it in a while, go back and read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Look at the creation of uh, Adam and Eve. Look at uh, how Adam was created and Eve was created from a 
uh, a rib from his side and how God brought them together and said, a man shall leave his father and mother, cling to his wife, they shall be one flesh. And so we really have what we call kind of that first marriage that occurs right there uh, in Scripture. Then when we jump in here, when you look in uh, Genesis uh, 3, right there in the very beginning, it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field. There will be times that folks will come up and say, well, Brother Archie, I'd really like to know about heaven, but I, we just don't really know that much about heaven. We know a lot about heaven. We know the streets are made of gold. We know there's some tremendous big walls with a bunch of jewels and stuff. And we know there are pearly gates, not just in the jokes that you hear, but huge pearls uh, in the gates. Uh, we know that it's a cube, basically. It's 1,500 miles square. We know the size of it. There's a lot of things about heaven. So some people say, well, we, maybe we know stuff about heaven. We don't know much about the devil. We know a whole lot about Satan. If you go back in Isaiah 14, you'll see where he falls from heaven. Basically, Satan at one point, he's a created being. He was a created angel. Some scholars will say probably one of the most greatest angels of all time that at some point probably protected the throne room, if you can say it like that. There's an antiphonal in heaven where it goes back and forth among the angels in the throne room. It's a kind of a hymn that goes back and forth. Some say that he was that much of an anointed cherubim at that time, but he wanted to and tried to usurp God. He wanted to be God. So basically he was cast out of heaven. And so here we have him. Isaiah 14 gives a little bit of a picture of that. We know if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says the God of this world, little g, the little g of this world. If you look in Ephesians 2, it says he's a prince of the power uh, of the air. Uh, we, if you look in 1 Peter, I think it's chapter 5, uh, verse 8, says he describes him as a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We know a lot about him now because we're on this side of the cross. But here he comes, and so he's basically standing upright, uh, disguised in that kind of form as we see in Scripture, and most of us think more of that snake form kind of like that. And he comes and he begins to talk to her. And what he does, he sows a lie. Now here's what you need to grasp from this today. Here's what Satan wants to do. In your life as a believer, some of you are here who are unbelievers, you're not born again, you haven't come to that place of putting your faith and trust in Christ. He sows a lie in your life. So it can be in the life of an unbeliever into the life of a believer. He wants you to doubt the goodness and the character of God. Now, if you just step back a little bit and think about all the stuff that's going on in the world and the things around, because I always say the enemy is a mastermind behind a lot of this stuff that's happening around the world and that. And he wants you to doubt the goodness and the character of God. So what he does, he, he sows a lie into E. He disguises stuff, and he kind of takes maybe a little bit of truth with a whole bunch of error and kind of wraps it around, which in fact is lies. So the first lie that he sows into her life, he says, indeed has God said. He is causing her to doubt God's Word. He is attacking the Word of God. Indeed has God said, if you read it in the text, that you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. Sometimes we look at a text in Scripture, and we look at it, and we think, man, that's just so complicated. Most of the time, it's not very complicated. Most of the time, the reason we think it's complicated, because there's something in our life that's not right, and we really want to disobey that passage of Scripture. Therefore, we think it's complicated. Therefore, we begin to try to take that Scripture and twist it a little bit and say, well, I don't really think that's what God meant when He said that. And see, that's what the enemy wants to do. If you look back up into Genesis 2, says man and woman. It's pretty simple. He created them. Man shall leave his father and mother, cling to his wife, be one flesh. That is not complicated. That's not confusing. It's very simple. But what Satan wants to do, and let's use that as an example, what he wants to do is he wants to make you doubt that. He wants to cause you to doubt that. He wants to cause you to rethink, did God really say that? Yes, God said that. And, and we'll see in a moment, God is not a killjoy. God is not trying to take something from you. The Lord God Almighty only wants the best for our lives. If Satan can cause you to doubt that, he can win a, a victory. Even the life of a believer, he can win a victory in life. He said, indeed. Did God really say that? And if you look at her response, Eve, she kind of adds a few things to it a little bit. She says, well, he said you, you can't eat of this, and we can't touch it. And if we eat of it, like we're going to die. Well, maybe in the context, that's kind of what Adam kind of relayed that message to her, you know, in regard to this. And guess what, ladies? Adam is right there with her. He's passive 
in this deal. He's not leading out as he should. That's why when God comes in the garden in a moment and calls out, he don't call out for Eve. He calls out for Adam. He didn't call for her. He called for Adam. You said, well, Eve's the one that did it. Adam was there. Adam was responsible for this. So you got both folks. So that's the first lie, which caused you to doubt God's word. Here's the second lie he sows in her life and into our lives. There's no penalty for your sin. Because he says, well, God, did he really say it? Did he really mean it? And then he says in verse 4, he said, you surely will not die. You surely will not die. We live today in a culture, and it's real easy for maybe us to look around and say, well, I know so-and-so. This individual is a bad person, and they are so successful. And so sometimes folks will say, they're all, they, that's usually, you know, when people come to me, a lot of times outside the church, they'll always say, well, I saw one of you deacons over here. That's what, <laughs> that's what they, they say stuff like that. Uh, well, I saw this church member. I saw this. Yeah. And, but they'll usually come and say, well, well, you know, you say this God is so loving good. Well, so-and-so, he's a terrible person. He hates dogs and hates people and won't talk to folks, you know, and runs over mailboxes. And I don't know why I brought that up, but you know what I mean. Just a bad person. And they say, but he's just fine. And, and, and then I always say, well, God says the rain's on just and unjust, you know, and stuff. And they're like, well, nothing's ever happened. I, and I always say, well, judgment one day is coming. There's consequences of sin. And he tells me, he says, you surely will not, I guarantee you, Eve in heaven today was thinking, if I could go back and get a redo on that one, Lord, <laughs> please send me back in time and let me get a redo. You know, let me do this one over again. I'm a lot smarter now than I was in and Adam would go, I failed. I, you know, I should have stepped up and all this, but it doesn't happen like that. There's consequences, but he sows a lie. Now, here's a question we kind of need to ask real quick to ourselves. Have we doubted God's word? I mean, in what's taking place in our world and things that are going on in our life, and you can just apply it across the board. There, there are places that we've doubted God's Word because the enemy's trying to sow that into you. Are you at that point thinking, well, there's just no penalty for what I do or how I react in this. There's no consequences to my sin. Could it be that we're doing that? Here's the last one that he says. He basically says, another lie he sows. He says, if you do this, God knows that when you do it, you're going to be like Him. You're going to be like God. Now, you say, well, Satan is so smart. Let me just let you in on a secret here. He is a demonic being. His day is coming. Basically, hell, we see in the New Testament, has been prepared for him. Now, it's going to be the place of eternal separation, eternal judgment for all those who don't follow Christ, but it's really a place prepared for him. And so, he, he knows that that is coming uh, one day for him. And, and no doubt about that. So, what he wants to do is bring as much confusion and everything that he can. But what Satan wants to do, he says, hey, you know what? You will be like God if you do this. You're going to know uh, all of this stuff that God knows. In fact, what he's trying to sow into is that God is keeping something back from you. He's holding back something good from you. And if you go down this path, you're going to be smarter than him. You're going to get the joy that he wants to keep from In fact, what Satan wants to kind of build into the minds of people is that, hey, that, you know, uh, God doesn't want the best for you. God's a killjoy in your life. And if you go down this path to sin, you're going to get all the fulfillment you want. And you think he's so smart. The same lies that he told thousands of years ago right here in this text are the same lies that he's telling today. For those of us that are believers. Some got saved uh, early in life. Uh, maybe there's some stuff that got in their life. They walked away from the Lord for a while. They didn't lose their salvation. And you can't do that. But conviction came and there's repentance. So you're walking in the right relationship with the Lord. Maybe like me, you got saved later in life. I remember what it's like to be lost. I remember what it's like to try to find fulfillment in the stuff of this world whether it was getting a chemistry set and trying to blow stuff up or whatever, you know, I, I know what it's like to go down a path of alcohol. I know what it's like to pursue uh, a path, maybe a career or something. It's nothing wrong with being aggressive and doing well. And, and, and here's the thing, God is a, he's the builder of wealth in the lives of people. And there are many people that God is blessed and they're blessed to be a blessing. There's nothing wrong with those things. But when you try to find your fulfillment, and that's what Satan always tries to do. And even in the life of a believer, if he can, 
He can't take your salvation, but if he can take you and pull you uh, over here to begin to believe these lies, he has paralyzed you in his walk. We live in a broken world. That's why Christ came, was born in a manger. That's why he went to the cross at Calvary. That's why he was raised on the third day. That's why he's coming back one day. You may not have caught this either, but we sing that song we know, you know, in that. And it says, we know he's coming back one day. He's going to make things right. So before we kind of move on to this uh, second part, ask yourself, has has the enemy sowed a lie into your life? Because it says right here, it says, Eve looks at the tree. It's the same thing today it was then. Looks good for foods. It's the lust of the flesh. Desirable to the eyes. It's the lust of the eyes. I will be wise. It's the pride of life. It's one Two, three. Some of you are circular thinkers out here. You think in this realm. I don't function in that realm. I'm like one, two, three. When I read the text, desirable for food, flesh. Desirable for the eyes, lust of the eyes. I will be wise, the pride of life. It's the James passage. We give in to sin, we're tempted. It's like the animal getting caught in the snare. You see, we live in a broken world. Now, here's the good news. But in the midst of this, because in our unfaithfulness, God is faithful. Isn't that good? We see the promise. Now, before we get to the promise, we got the shame and the blame that takes place. So, I know, I know you're going to laugh at this. I don't say that word naked the right way, I think. Angie always corrects me, and she's not here in this service. She's in the first one. So, I'm going to say it the only way I know how to say it. Before the fall, they were naked without clothes. There's no shame. You think, well, that's kind of wild. They were basically unclothed, but clothed spiritually in the love and the grace of God. They, They did not understand, did not know sin, bought into the lies, took of the fruit, ate it. Satan, his task was completed. So you have sin is entered in. All of a sudden, they like, oh, no, we have no clothes. They get in the bushes, the trees, have fig leaves, and they cover themselves. And so when the Lord comes, where are you? He calls for Adam. Well, it's not like he didn't know where they were. But he calls, so there can be that response. They respond, well, how would you know you're naked? Well, <laughs> you know, did you eat of the tree? I already knew that. And it's, it's shame. Before I came to faith in Christ, If uh, not proud of my history, but my goal was always to be the life of the party, wherever it was. If they said to me, hey, I bet you won't swim in that pond, I'd go swimming in that pond. I bet your truck can't go through that. I'd drive that truck through that. I don't know why. I just lived life in that kind of way. I was sinning, and I knew enough from right and wrong to pray at night for forgiveness, but I didn't mean it. I never wanted my mom and daddy to find out what I was really like. I really didn't care what other people thought about me because really everybody else I ran with were just like me. I really had no shame. But in a church service, and God was already dealing with me before that, but in a church service, as the holiness of God came in, And I always say, the tsunami of my sin rode over me. I was shameful because I was before holy God. Nobody had to say, Archie, you being a drunk is wrong. They didn't have to tell me that. I knew it. They didn't have to say, your mouth's foul. I knew it. They didn't have to say these things. Things I knew. I was shameful. And guess what? There was a point on the back row, I was in the bushes trying to find everything I could to cover my sin. You know what happens a lot of times is the Holy Spirit of God moves in and we run in the bushes and we begin to justify. And we begin to say, we say, well, everybody's doing this. And we begin to try to cover our sin. If uh, you cover your sin, God will expose it. If you expose your sin... 
God will cover it. Let me say that one more time. You say, can you do it? I'm not 100% sure. Let me think. If you expose your sin, confess, repent, God will cover it. If you cover your sin, stay in the bushes. Think nobody knows. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, go read them. Everything's laid bare before the eyes of whom we have to do. If you cover your sin, he will expose it. You see, there was shame. There was blame. Well, this woman you gave me. And the woman's like, this serpent showed up. And then we see what happens. The, for all the men out here, he says, there's toil and work, and the sweat of your brow. I know it's an agriculture, it's an agrarian term, but it's really about working. Uh, for all the ladies out here, pain in childbirth. I tell people all the time, I'm so glad God did not make me a woman. I have a very low pain threshold. I want you to know that. I tell Angie, she's the toughest woman I know in a lot of ways. She is in that. And I don't laugh about that, as I say. But here's the curse. So, men, we see this, working and the sweaty brow and all that stuff. Ladies, childbirth and relationships. He's like, man, we live in a broken world. He said, you're going to pursue to, over your husband. He's going to rule over you. It's relationship issues. We're in a broken world. So it's blame and shame and pain. But then the promise comes. And so the Lord says this. He says, uh, he said, here's the deal. E, basically, <laughs> your offspring is going to be the Savior. But what he says to Satan, he says, you're going to bruise his heel, <laughs> and he's going to crush your head. Now, those are real, it's simple terminology. So, Jesus comes. He's placed in a manger in a cave. And a manger, like, it's where the cows have been eating. They're bad eaters, if you don't know that. No manners. All these animal stuff. He's placed in a feeding trough. Satan was trying to, trying to bruise him, bruising his heel. Herod raises up, wants to kill everybody under the age of two. Satan can't do anything but bruising. Ends up, after running around for a while, Nazareth, lives in obscurity for 30 years, begins a ministry, the Son of God. They make fun of him. They want to throw him off the mountain. Satan He's trying to attack him, but only can bruise his heel. Gets to the end of the three years. They take him by trial at night. They beat him in that trial, the Sanhedrin. Satan's attacking, but only can bruise him. <laughs> Peter denies him three times. Judas betrayed him. Just a bruising on the heel. They take him before Pilate. He says, there's nothing that deserves death. They yell for Barabbas. They take him, they flog him, almost to the point of death. They knew how to do that. This bruise his heel. They put him on the cross. They nailed him. They come by and wag their heads. They stuck a spear in his side. They just bruised his heel. He dies on the cross. They take him down, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They put him in a bar tomb. He just bruised our Savior on the heel of his foot. The bottom side. But on the third day, when Jesus Christ came out of the grave, Jesus crushed his head. He crushed his head. Sin no longer can enslave us or have dominion over us. Do we live in a broken world? Yes. Is he coming back? Yes. <laughs> can, we, can we function and have peace and joy in the midst of the brokenness? Yes. Because, he said, you're going to bruise his heel, he's going to crush your head. It was a promise that happened. But also, that time of Calvary was foreshadowed when we see in the Scripture that he made animal skins to clothe them. I can remember after I was saved, there was a desire to study the Word of God. I'd grown up in church, like many of you. I'd heard this story <laughs> probably numerous times. Now, I slept a lot in church. I'm just going to tell you, that's what I did. It was a snooze time for me. But I know I, it covered this. But, but even after I was saved, I remember the first time I read through this as a believer, filled with the Spirit of God. 
And I read, he made skins from animals. I'd seen it numerous times. And I can remember, this is not weird or mystical or kind of stuff like that. But it's like when you read in the Bible, God pricked a person's heart. My heart just leapt for joy. (laughs) I mean, really, it was a supernatural, like, what, what? And I thought, I've read this so many times. I've seen it. He made it. There was a blood sacrifice. You say, well, there was a blood sacrifice, but they were, they were kicked out of the garden. There are consequences of forgiven sin. He covered them with the blood of animals, which was a foreshadowing, just like the promise before of the Savior who was coming. Why did he come? We celebrate Christmas, and we have family and friends. He came because we're in a broken world. He came to seek and save that which was lost. Here's the invitation. Have you bought into the lies of the enemy? They have not changed. They're dressed up. They got on a different dress. May have a little different makeup on them. It's still the same lie. Have you bought into it? You see, a lot of times it comes to Scripture. We're all good with it until somebody in our family is not good with it. And then because we love someone in our family and we love a friend or an acquaintance or a worker, we love them and we care for them and we never stop loving, never stop caring. But then what happens is it may cause us to want to doubt God's Word. In this, there have been numerous times as a pastor, someone will come to me and they will begin to explain a situation. And look, they're my friends. I love them. I care for them. I never stop loving. I never stop caring. I never stop praying for them. And they'll come. And my response, when it all comes down, I'll say, what you want me to do is you're, you want me to bless your sin. Well, that's not what I mean. Now, that's what you're telling me. You want me to bless your sin. I say, look, I love you. I care for you. I cannot bless your sin. I cannot condone that. I will help you. I will do everything I can. But I cannot step across that line. We're at a place in our culture. There is, and it's always been like this. There's always a pulling and a drawing. Have you doubted God's word? And it could be as a believer, it's something you just need to confess and repent of today and say, you know, Lord, show me, teach me, give me strength in this. Could it be that? Could it be that, you know, you've allowed the enemy to get a, man, get a stronghold in your life in some way. You need to Repent of that. Maybe that it could be that you say, man, I'm just, you know, I didn't really understand the brokenness of this world. It is, and God has us here for such a time as this. But most importantly, I always say this. Maybe you're kind of hiding in the bushes today. And you do sense the conviction, the shame. It takes your breath. And you think, well, well, nobody knows. Well, God knows. And you may say, well, I'm in these bushes. <laughs> I got everything covered, me, and, and God can't see me. You know better than that. You say, well, God's a tyrant out there, and he's screaming for me. No, God is a God who loves you. And he's gently calling your name. You see, that's why he's unlike probably anybody we've ever known before. He loves you. And he says, you know what? You failed. You made a mistake. I love you. And I died at Calvary. And I shed my blood so that your shame could be removed and so that you could have life. You can have forgiveness. The greatest thing in the need of some of your lives is you just need to be clean. You've been carrying the guilt and the shame and the pain so long, you just need to be clean. Come to the Savior. He'll clean you. He'll forgive you. He'll save you. But you've got to come in repentance. You've got to come in faith. You've got to come believing and trusting in Him and Him alone. That's salvation. Some of you need to repentance unto salvation today. There's going to be pastors here. There's going to be deacons here. Genesis 3, the why of Christmas. (laughs) Because we're broken, and He loves us. He's faithful even when we're unfaithful. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, you're so good. So, Lord, in this invitation, for believers, it may be we just need to get right 
Maybe we've doubted your word. We've bought into the lies of the enemy. Lord, doesn't mean that situations are easy that we're in, whether if it's at work or family or recreation or whatever. But Lord, we can have peace in the midst of that by trusting in you and looking to you. So Lord, it could be that for a believer. And I know, Lord, there's, there's folks here, folks engaging with us. They need you this morning. Holy Spirit, you're in charge of saving people. So I pray that you save somebody today. It's in your name we pray, the name of Christ. Amen. Can we stand, please?